Tony, we've all seen these movies, we've all read these uh, thrillers, these images swirl in our head about what espionage is like. How much are these popular images uh, that we have seen and that, that we all carry with us are real, if any? <laughs> well, I like to think that they're all real and <laughs> we're all still doing it. Uh, reality is a great mirror for, uh, for the fantasy world. And uh, if, as we would usually say, uh, if we hadn't invented this, we couldn't possibly do it because it doesn't make sense. But let's go off and do it anyway. I think Tony's right that behind the popular images is something, but the something behind is absolutely nothing like <laughs> the thing on, on the top, the superficial. And my, I suppose the reason I made that remark was that there is a danger, it seems to me, that sometimes people actually believe the superficial, believe the presentation that they're given, and that can be actually damaging to the real stuff that's going on behind. We've got a series in Britain, which in Britain is called Spooks, but I think mm. here it's called MI5, which um, you know indicates that here's MI5 and they're full of kind of elegant looking women and blokes and they're all wearing leather jackets and kind of rushing around. And they save the world every week, about five of them, from some <laughs> terrible thing. You know, using gadgetry that we have never dreamt up. And I think that kind of thing can be quite damaging, actually. When MI5 is trying to present itself, you know, as a serious organisation that's trying to protect the country against serious harm, and it's just lurking in the back of people's minds, hmm, they're those guys in the leather jackets and stuff. <laughs> so I think there's a danger of it, but it's not going to go away, so we have to hmm. go with it. There was a programme called Mission Impossible, not the Tom Cruise version. But it was a weekly te television show on Thursday night or whatever. We had to assign somebody to watch that every time. Because the next thing you know, the, fo the phone is ringing. Can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, on, on the show, what we try to do is, you know, the, the most of the work that happens at, at the CIA in human intelligence operations is about recruiting and running spies, right? I mean, you try to meet people recruit them, manipulate them, and get them to give you secrets. And what we wanted to do on the show was show more of that on television, show what the human dimension of it is. But if you just do that, even that can get kind of dull. So we're trying to mix that up and at least get some of that in there. Now, Jeff, I'm, I'm, I don't think too many of us uh, are in this work. And I don't think um, our parents were encouraging us in saying, you know, I think you really should become a hacker or a covert agent. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, how old were you when you started hacking, and 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 how did you get into this into this realm? Well, I I wanted to be a hacker much sooner than I became a hacker. And how old were you? I mean, so we're I talking young. You look 12. young now, but you were really young. <laughs> <laughs> I was about 12 when I wanted to, and I didn't actually meet real hackers to show me until I was probably about 14 or 15. So. I, I was on the other side, right? I'm trying to meet the people that are, have the knowledge, because there was no Google or Amazon. You couldn't just read a book on hacking. There wasn't such a book. So you had to go find other people to pass on the knowledge. And unfortunately, that world was full of a lot of people that didn't know what they were talking about. So they'd pass on a lot of bogus information. And it took you a long time to figure out what was true and what wasn't. Was not. Can you, how do you go about, you know, what are the forensics? How do you go about doing what you call uh, an identity transformation, either in the Argo case or, or in another case? Well, it's, the identity transformation is the, is the whole ball of wax when you're talking about clandestine activity. Uh, there's no way to get out of your armchair in Washington and end up in Moscow without penetrating a couple borders and, get, and telling somebody a lie. So that's where it starts. It's a, it's a, it's a, a scenario. Then you start adding the pieces to it. Uh, and the practical problems, and uh, you'll end up with about 20 different experts that work on a piece of this kind of operation. Uh, we, we had the best linguists that you could, could find, but they had to be able to fall into the role and play the role of uh, a foreign persona. So that would take a, a really good language person in the area of studies and so forth. But uh, when I reported in, 
the Office of Legal Technical Services, uh, where a lot of identity transformation is done, I, I was entering into the process that, w that was necessary at the time to uh, move our people clandestinely. clandestinely. And uh, we were able to do that well. We not only were able to defeat the KGB's very sophisticated counterintelligence uh, surveillance using disguise techniques, we were also able to penetrate any border in the world. We, are, we set out to, to create a recipe for each border and, and have that recipe on the, uh, the shelf and up to date. I mean, do you, do you approach an Al-Qaeda cell the same way you would uh, some, you know, an IRA or, or some other, uh, other group? Um, well, you have to remember I'm a counter spy, so my job is to uh, stop people like Tony, uh, from, <laughs> <laughs> except they're our friends, but people like Tony, <laughs> the side of whatever it is, uh, from being successful. So MI5's job is to try and protect the country against, against any threats to our national security, whatever they are. And you're right that during my career, they changed quite radically because I joined, as I said, at the height of the Cold War, where the main threat to our security came from the Soviet Union and their allies and their efforts at espionage in our country and the countries of the West and subversion as they tried to undermine Western democracies by spreading world communism. And the way we tried to deal with that was in conjunction with our allies in the United States and in other parts of the world, our old established allies, we tried to identify as many of the, um, of the operatives, of the KGB officers or whatever it was, as we possibly could. We tracked them as they moved round the world. We informed each other. We studied their techniques. We studied their embassies where they had their, um, their residentura. And we aimed to know as much as we possibly could about those outfits, the way they worked, um, etc. And that was the way we dealt with espionage. As a hacker, in the early days, um, you, it's very important to hide your identity from other hackers um, and your parents and your <laughs> 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 and uh, law enforcement or whatever. And in the, in, the, in the early days, it was you were trying to break into systems um, to get access for knowledge. There was no money online. There was nothing to steal. It was purely an exploratory adventure. Um, but to do that, you had to, I alluded to it earlier, you needed to meet other people who could tell you this is how the phone system works, or this is how, and, uh, and you didn't know if you could trust them, and uh, so you took on an identity. And then everything you did was with that identity, or you could have multiple identities for different things. And if you ever made a mistake, or you pissed someone off, or you made an enemy, you could burn that identity, not use that anymore, and as long as nobody could tie that identity to your true identity, you could just kind of close that chapter off in your life. It was like a mulligan. You got a do-over. And, um, and the, but the longer you had an identity, the more energy you'd invested in it, the hacking handle. So I've had this handle, the dark tangent, for about 20 years. I've had other ones, but that's my main identity, and I've invested the most amount of energy in that. Then what would happen is you would talk to other hackers, and you'd say, can I trust that guy? He's going by the handle, you know, Dark Knight. Can I trust that? I don't that trust guy. anyone who's named Dark Notch. Yeah. <laughs> well, the problem is people would name themselves after popular movies. I don't know how many red dragons, blue dragons, black dragons I'd come across. But you would try to say, does anybody know that guy? And they don't know who they really are, but they know the identity, the handle. And, um, and so if anybody new came along, you didn't know who they were, and their handle was brand new, and nobody knew them, you probably couldn't trust them. And so it took a long time to build up this layer of trust. And, uh, and a lot of the tradecraft you do for hiding your agents, well, I didn't have a government protecting me. So everything I did, you, know, you were doubly paranoid about everything. Pay phones, you never used your home phone. Other hackers would try to get dirt on other hackers. And then it would sort of like, if you knew their real identity, you could sort of control them. Because you could tell their parents what they're up to. You could. <laughs> 